the problem is that, that most users don't really understand why adding an asterisk at the end of the password makes it more it makes it stronger. They don't understand why having numbers makes it more complex. And um, and and a lot of times when they're when they're uh, given an error message that says the password does not meet complexity requirements, it's hard to understand what exactly it would take to meet complexity requirements of you know, the, the password policy. And um, and to simplify it, what I recommend is 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 not put so much emphasis on the characters using the password, but focus more on the length of the password. Because the fact is that adding just a couple characters length to your password is equivalent to adding using numbers and symbols and, and, and anything other than lowercase letters. Uh, a 15 character lowercase pa a password made up of all lowercase letters is just as strong as a shorter password made of, of a wide diversity of characters. So you know, I, I recommend long passwords. I recommend 15 characters or more in your password, and um, and it's it, it makes up for a lot of the policies that users get so frustrated with. It would be very easy to tell users you have to have a 15-character password. It could be anything you want. Um, a lot of a lot of my techniques are are um, contradict a lot of traditional security policy, but if you do the math, the, the numbers are there. Okay, so if the company's got a really smart admin who's patched their boxes and a smart router guy who's locked down their routing and a smart firewall guy who's locked down their firewalls, then it's probably easiest for us to find their secretary who's just written her password on her desktop um, if it gives us the same access. Um, the secretary angle is an interesting one because often you'll find a big company heavily focused on security and the CEO's right hand is his secretary who has all his access, access to all his documents, access to just about everything. And a lot of efforts put into making sure that the CEO doesn't leak information, but nobody told the secretary that. And she's still downloading Fantasia.exe and still getting past all the corporate safeguards that are there, allowing you all the way into the CEO's office. For 40 years, we've been computing on a flawed basis of how we're trying to do computer security. You know, we, if you read these papers from 71, you know, people are talking about, hey, we need hardware security tied to the software so that we can have this chain of trust through the levels of, of all the software that runs in your enterprise so everything kind of is trusted to each other and, and we know what's supposed to be running and what's not supposed to be running. In 1972, that was a really hard problem, really hard problem. And so what we came up with instead was this defense in depth idea. You layer on all the security and everything becomes better. And it turns out that once you put enough layers on, you're pretty secure, but oh, a few more layers doesn't hurt. So you buy some more products and you add some more layers. And I'm not sure it makes you any more secure, but it sure does sell a lot of stuff. So I find it you know, very frustrating that we've reached that point. We have technology today to allow us to have trusted hardware running on PCs. And we have you know, um, companies that are already deploying the, at least the, the core chip technology that you need to leverage this. Um, IBM in their ThinkPads, Lenovo, I guess we would call them today, um, Apple and their MacBooks and a few other companies are integrating these uh, trusted platform modules in their uh, portable workstations and some of their desktops. Now, the trusted platform module on its own doesn't necessarily make the system more secure, but it provides a secure cryptographic store for secrets, for doing um, encrypting data, decrypting data, and attesting to the integrity of a host, which basically, in a nutshell, allows a host to say, hey, this is the configuration I'm supposed to have, and I still have it. It's still the same software that's running, hasn't been violated, there's no buffer overflows that have occurred, there's no attackers here, I'm still okay. When I used to run a security operations center, I, all I wanted was a one or a zero. <laughs> I wanted everything's okay, or no it's not, go fix it. Um, but with this defense in depth idea, we talk about analysis and distilling all this data and trying to make sense of this huge audit trail that exists. It shouldn't be that hard. 
Um, and I think what we're seeing with the internet as it stands today, we've had this huge explosion of hosts on it, and you know, security's gotten asymptotically better over time. You know, we're making a little progress here and there, but it's not. There hasn't been a big step function where we say, "Oh, now it's a lot better." Uh, I think this trust in computing has the capability to say, "Oh, it's a lot better." There's a lot of concerns about trust in computing and the bad aspects, digital rights management, for instance, where. People, you know, I buy an MP3 from someplace and I can't make use of it, because, you know, because um, I've suddenly moved to a new computer and it's no longer bound to this trusted chip, and so I can't listen to my music. So, God help me. And, and everyone thinks it's a loss of privacy and a loss of their rights on their computing platform. If, as a security industry, we can't overcome that, we're kind of lost.